Uh, the National Computer Science School summer program uh, offers another, bringing a small group of students together to build a working social networking site in just three days. Um, so please welcome Katie Bell of Brock Walt Learning as she takes us through some of the inner workings of that program. Thank you. So before I start, I just want to know how many of you are teachers? I know we did this before. Yep, okay. How many of you who are teachers have heard of the NCSS challenge? Yes, okay. How many of you have had students who have done the challenge? Yeah, okay, about half. That's pretty good. All right, so before I jump in, this is particularly topical because the NCSS challenge starts on Monday this year. So, you know, it's a little bit late for you to like suddenly get your whole class to be doing it at the same time. Um, but I want to plug this. It is a five week long online programming competition, all in Python. Um, you can see where I got the picture from my slide. The, um, it's marketed as a competition because we find this is a good way to motivate students. It is in fact an entire Python course that starts at the beginning and teaches you everything you need to know in order to do the competition. The interface looks, oh, there's, there's kind of two. This one is there's, um, there are four different levels of ability and I guarantee you that advanced is too advanced for your kids. Um, this is the easiest one where we actually have a block form of Python. So if you have younger kids that are coming up from scratch or something, this is a lot more accessible to start off with. But the Python code that it translates to is always there. And we find that as kids are starting to get frustrated with the blocks, they really want to jump into the Python. So this is a good sort of transition way. Um, I added in this slide, like while um, I think Peter was talking this morning, this year we're starting logo as well. So there'll be a bunch of logo questions because logo is not dead. Um, that will be in the beginner stream uh, this year. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and if you have questions about that, ask me. Okay, so that was our brief interlude into the NCSS challenge. I'm actually here to talk about the NCSS summer school, uh, which is run by the University of Sydney. Um, this is a photo of a bunch of students from last, from this pre last uh, January. Um, it is a 10 day long summer camp where we get about 100 students uh, to come to the University of Sydney. They stay in one of the colleges and we teach them Python. There's actually two streams. There's a Python stream and a Arduino robotics stream, but I'm going to ignore that and talk only about the Python stream today because this is PyCon. Um, it is um, the, the students, essentially we started doing the online NCSS challenge competition because we wanted to reach more than just 100 students. We still do have the summer camp for the 100 students, but you need to bear in mind that these are not the average students that you will find in a classroom. These are the students that have gone through an application process. These are the sort of gifted and talented students. Um, a lot of them have programming experience before, not necessarily in Python. Um, but we end up with a very broad, but we also accept a lot of students that have no prior programming experience, but are usually the sort of more academic high achiever kind of students. Uh, so we expect them to be able to pick up programming a bit faster than an, uh, the average student, but we do have a very broad range of abilities. We also accept teachers, and I'll get to that later on. This is what the program looks like. Um, it runs for 10 days, so each of these columns is a day. And we start with a, a lecture at 9 a.m. in the morning, and we don't really give them any free time until 10 p.m. at night when we send them to bed. So the, um, the first half of the camp here, the sort of first three days, that is when we are just teaching them Python, They're going through uh, learning from the beginning. This is an if statement, blah, blah, blah. This is a loop. Um, we use the Grok website, uh, which is what we use for the NCSS challenge. Uh, in the, the lab time uh, for them to get practice with a series of questions where they have a challenge problem, they write the answer, and it runs through a sequence of tests because um, we find that this is a good way to teach. And we do that for the first half. And then these sort of last three days, in the middle, we have a sort of a day off with, to give them a little bit of a break because it's very intense. In the evenings, we have sort of fun programs. Uh, this site visits column in the middle is where we take all of the students to visit the offices of a bunch of the companies that sponsor NCSS. So companies like Wise Tech Global, Google, um, and Atlassian, um, cool companies that do lots of really cool software engineering. Uh, we go and visit their offices for a day. So the students get an idea of what it's like to work in the industry. Then these last three days are kind of uh, very 
intense on the project. This is the entire amount of time that we have to do the big project that we have. We have the, the about 100 kids. We have uh, last year four Python groups. Each group has about 12 students in it. And those 12 students are working together to build a single project, which is an interesting sort of project management challenge in its own right. Um, so the reason that we do this, the reason we have this kind of big project that we do as a group is because over the years, I um, should probably mention that like, we've been running this same project, building a social networking site, for the last six years. Before that, we were doing search engines. Apparently, search engines aren't cool anymore. It's all social networking sites these days. Um, but the, the reason we do this is because we find that there are three different ways to motivate kids that get kids really excited about computer science. And the first one is learning how stuff works. They want to see the programs that I use every day, the websites that I visit every day, um, the phone apps, whatever. I want to understand how it works on the inside. Uh, the other thing is some kids are just motivated by, I want to build a cool thing that I can show off to my friends, to my mom. Um, I want to build the same things that I use every day. I want to build Facebook. Um, and then there's a bunch of kids that are purely interested <laughs> in the problem solving. Most kids are a mix of these, but some kids are really into the, like, the, the entire process of I have a problem, I need to break it down into steps, and that kind of puzzle solving uh, is motivation enough. We're trying to kind of combine all of these into a project that will then be exciting and interesting for all of the students. Um, and we think we've done a pretty good job of this. But the key to this is building a website that is functional, that you can see how it's a real website that you could put on the internet and people would use it, um, but also without magic. You don't want to be run this command, run this function, boom, you have a website. Magic. Um, because that completely breaks the uh, understanding how stuff works part. We want to give the kids an idea of how each of the pieces fits together, how each of the pieces works, as well as being able to build something cool. And these things are kind of at odds with each other, where you want to build something impressive quickly, but you also want to understand at a base level how it works. So how do we do this? Um, so yep, the, the task is to build a social networking site. We interpret social networking site extraordinarily loosely. Uh, this is one of the examples of a social networking site that the students build. It's called Word by Word, where people can collaboratively write a story by, one, by adding one word to the, the tree, and then they can vote on which word becomes part of actually the story. I'm not sure if it ever ended up with actually good stories. Um, but we've had sites about event planning, sites about sort of sharing a wish list and organizing group presence between a group of friends, um, a site for getting primary school kids interested in reading. This is all very open to interpretation. OK, so at a basic level, this is the kind of Python. Oh, so we start with Tornado. So Tornado is the web framework. It's kind of like Flask. It serves the same purpose. It is a bunch of Python functions that you run that then run a website. Um, but we decided this was too complicated. There was too much magic. In the three days that we have to teach Python, we don't actually get up to classes or object-oriented programming. So we kind of wanted to take that out. Um, a couple of these things looks particularly like complicated where you have your, your IO loop that is many functions sort of chained together here. Um, so we wrote a very thin wrapper around Tornado to simplify things. So this is the interface that we give the students to serve a web website. So we have our own little uh, tornado.ncss module that we've added. It doesn't actually do very much. It's just a single file, but it makes the interface much cleaner for the students to work with. So in this case, we're just importing a single module instead of importing different modules to do different things. Um, very similar to Flask. I love how all of the talks previously to this have explained all of the concepts that I now assume that you understand. Um, so we have a function here. Um, and we register with our server that if we go to this URL, in this case, the top level URL, it should call this function. And this function writes to the response, hello world. So in this case, it's not HTML. It's just going to write the text, hello world, so that when you run the server, go to localhost 8000, it will just say hello world. It's a very simple server. 
Um, then we get into HTML. And we decided to start off with straight HTML rather than using a templating engine. And I'll get to that immediately, because the templating engine is kind of magic, and we're trying to avoid magic here. So we're very much saying all the server is doing is grabbing a chunk of HTML and writing it to the response. And this is all of the magic that we are, we are letting you see. right? Um, so that when you go to that particular URL in your web browser, it says, hello world, here we have a website. Um, so this, we find, is sort of simple enough. It's enough sort of magic to grasp that you go to this web server, it sends HTML, and it's the browser that uses HTML to display whatever it is that it displays. But you can go to any other website, and you can say, look, all of these other websites are made of HTML as well. Okay. Of course, you're going to want to do more complicated things than just here is a bunch of HTML that doesn't do anything exciting. Uh, here is another screenshot of a site that was created at one of the NCSS camps. Um, this has sort of a user registration process. Um, so here is an example of doing um, multiple pages. So we have the sort of uh, original page, a login page. Well, these aren't really pages, they're just handlers. Um, and a couple of uh, functions to handle those. Um, we have some nice functions here that allow us to get cookies and set cookies so that we can do a login system. Um, again, I would go through in more detail, but I'm probably going to run out of time. Um, getting more complicated. OK, one of the key things as another step in the process as we are slowly building up this site and becoming more and more complicated and more and more powerful is we don't touch a database at the beginning. We do eventually get to a database. But the first version of the site that we get the students to build, firstly, does not use a templating engine, and then also does not use a database. We actually encourage the students to store all of the information that they need in an in-memory Python dictionary. Um, this is essentially the Python dictionary that they've been learning as they've been learning basic Python. Um, we have here, um, I've left out the HTML chunks. Um, so like. Here is actually the HTML that we're shoving uh, things into because it didn't fit on the slide. Um, but essentially, we have two pages here. We have the page which takes a um, form input. Actually, I have a demo running, so I should uh, jump to that so you can actually see what it does. That might be useful. Um, no points for uh, web design here because I find the students tend to like to experiment with that themselves rather than, um, OK. So we have a very simple form. I can put in my username. Uh, it'll just be Katie, my full name, and submit. And I have now been added to that Python dictionary. So if I go back to the code, um, when I submit this form, I have my little get fields. I'm getting the, uh, the form values and put it, creating a new uh, user dictionary and putting it into my users dictionary here over, he over here. So if I restart the server, I will clear everything in the database. But this is a good way to get started with a prototype without having to worry about how do I structure all of my data in my database. Um, you could just have a Python dictionary, get the sort of form submission stuff working. OK, I submit the form. It's added into the database. And I have another page over here, which loops through all of the users in the database and then constructs the HTML necessary to show those on the screen. So you get an idea of how, when you're running a web server, you take uh, what's in the database, you use what's in the database to generate HTML, and you return that HTML so that you have this kind of uh, dynamically generated HTML page. So you're getting that whole interaction happening before we've touched a templating engine and before we've touched a database, like an actual database. Um, OK, stepping up the complexity a little bit. Then we touch the database. Um, so here is a, an example uh, of our, one of our whiteboard discussions as we were planning out how the database would be structured, what tables we would have, and what uh, organization. I'm not going to go through all of this in a great detail, um, because previous talks have talked about SQLite, um, or SQLite, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, I agree that this is absolutely the best way to go uh, to run a website with a database uh, in a classroom. It is a lot less magic 
than pretty much any other database system you could possibly use. Because when you create the database, you have actually a file there that is your entire database. If you delete that file, then your database is gone. It's very concrete as much as a virtual file can be. Um, but it's still a powerful enough uh, database system. You're still learning SQL. You're still learning sort of real world skills of working with the database. But you don't need to have some extra sort of database serving process running on your machine as well. You have just this file. And of course, it's built into Python. Uh, so that makes things very simple as well. Um, so then we have a series of extension projects. So like I said, we have the gifted and talented kids that have been programming since they were eight. Um, and they do need an extra challenge. So one of the things that makes it nice delaying when we start doing using a templating engine, um, so a templating engine like Ginger or the Django templating engine that conveniently previous talks have talked about, um, we actually get a couple of the more advanced kids to build their own templating engine. So to build the process that reads the template file with the squiggly brackets and the percent signs and then generates the HTML from that. Um, this means that we have to wait for them to finish that before we start using the templating engine in the site, um, which is good. We make the kids do it the hard way by manually generating the HTML themselves, and then we show them the easy way. Um, but also, it is a really interesting problem for those kids that really need an extra push. I wouldn't recommend doing this in a classroom context because you will need to sit with the kids who are writing the templating engine the entire time. And that is if you are confident enough to write your own templating engine, which I assume most of you aren't. I've never actually done that myself either. Um, the other things that we give as extra projects are uh, password hashing. Usually the kids are very excited about that. There's always a couple of kids that are super into security and they wanted to learn these things. Um, Sometimes we'll get kids to write a nice set of Python libraries that wrap the database so that the other kids in the group don't even have to touch the SQL. I don't actually think that's a good idea because I think all of the kids should learn how the entire stack works, but that's fine. And also there's always little extra bits of JavaScript that you can do. Again, these are only necessary for the super advanced kids. How life in the projects in these three days goes um, is always a lot of fun and, a, and somewhat stressful. So like I said, we have um, a whole group of kids that have vastly different skill levels. There are some kids that have never programmed before, and by the time they get to this point in the camp, they're starting to, like, their brains are starting to melt. Um, most of the, actually all of the kids pretty much, have never worked on such a large project and such a large group before, and they just don't have the kind of teamwork skills necessary for it yet. Um, the students don't understand that if they write the code, it doesn't necessarily work unless they check that it actually works. Um, so there's a lot of broken code in there all of the time. We do use version control. Mostly we've been using SVN. We have been experimenting with Git. Uh, sometimes Git, so Git works, GitHub, having a GitHub account and for one student submitting their own code is completely fine. Students can deal with that. Having multiple students with multiple branches on a shared GitHub repository. I am told by one of the other tutors it worked really well for them last year. But for Jack and myself this year, it was awful. So I would recommend sticking with, um, yeah, being very careful with the use of version control. But I have done this project with a group of 12 kids without version control. And that was much worse. Um, <laughs> So I wouldn't go back to that. Um, also, the students have no idea what it means to write a function that then other people are going to need to call. So making it uh, intuitively usable or not changing it once other people have started using it. Um, these are all things that they have to learn the hard way as we go through the project. Um, so some things that we found, again, use version control. It's actually really good if you're doing group projects. Um, you can't lose anything. No one can actually delete all of the files because you have all of the revision history right there, uh, which is very convenient. Um, we do a lot of group brainstorming and sort of group planning of the project, but we're careful to keep this only at the very beginning. We try and get all of the kids on board that this is a shared idea, that they're all having input in, they're all designing the site together, they're all suggesting features. Oh, we could do this cool thing. Oh, it would be good if we had a button here that would do this. Um, so they're all on board, they all have ownership of the project, but making decisions as a big group is very, very slow, so we only do that at the beginning, and then after that, we just uh, 
tend to make a bit of executive decisions um, after that. We use very, very simple tools for managing the project throughout. And by very simple tools, I mean whiteboards. We don't use a bug tracking system. We don't use any kind of wiki system for documentation because you just don't have time in this short of time frame. Um, so we would have, say, a whiteboard with a list of the bugs that need fixing, and then we cross them out when they're done. And this works very, very well. Uh, in the same way, I have a picture here of a projector. Um, each of the computer lab rooms that we're in have a projector. We have the site, the current version of the site, up on the projector all the time. Uh, so we can see that there is something working there all the time. This is what our site is. This is what we're aiming for. And of course, throughout the project, uh, when you're working with a particular kid and they need to know something about another part of the site, it's like, oh, you really need to actually go over to the other side of the room and talk to Amy because she wrote that part of the system. So you should ask her how that thing works. Or if you, you should ask her if that bug is already fixed and you just need to update the version. Um, getting the kids to actually talk to each other is one of the, uh, the trickiest parts. <laughs> yep. Um, the other things, that, the most important thing that we've found is to have a site that is continually working. Instead of building up all of the pieces and then trying to smush them together at the end, this never works. Um, particularly because of no testing and because of no understanding of APIs. Um, we start with the simplest of simple sites and then build it up from there. How am I going for time? Oh, sweet. Okay. Should talk slower. Um, so we have. Okay. Um, so we have uh, a working site. So this is again what I was saying, where we start off with the simplest of simple sites and we don't add the database, we don't add the templating engine, we sort of add those as we go through. Uh, once the students are understanding how this part works, then we add the next complication. Um, this also means that we start off very simply with something that works, it doesn't do very much, and we add up from there. Um, the other thing is, say, the two kids that are working on the templating engine, we then have to get the whole class together at the same time so that they can explain the templating engine to everyone else and explain how it works. Um, or in one case, or in a case where someone has put in the login system, then those people need to explain to the whole class at once, uh, this is how the login system works. If you need to know what current user is logged in, then you need to call this function, sort of. Um, trying to explain that to each individual in the group at once uh, over time as they each hit the same problem is much, much slower. And so we find we quite often it's, it's always feels a bit wrong to interrupt the students when they're happily working away, but it is very important to stop everything, get everyone's attention. This is something that you need to know we are telling you now, um, and then let them get back to work. So we have a lot of interruptions as we're going through the project, but we found that that works better. The other thing, of course, which is another form of interruption, is when you get something working, when like some, there are two or three students working on some particular part of the site, for a couple of hours, they get something working, they get excited, we gather everyone around and we all look at it together and everyone is like, oh, that's so cool, that part of the site works now. Um, and these, the students can see that the different pieces of the site are coming together and they're actually building a thing that works, which is always really exciting. Okay. Here are a couple of examples of sites that have been made by the students in the past years. We've had the good fortune that we have a couple of professional web designers that work with us and help the students. I do not have the design skills. Um, but this one uh, was a site about uh, if you have a project uh, that you work on, so the puppies are kind of sample images that don't actually make sense with this site, but the students like the puppy images. Um, so you have a project, you have like progress pictures of the project, and you share that with other people. This is their social networking site. Um, this was the one I mentioned before where people can collaboratively write stories together um, by adding words and then voting on which word and which path of the story is best. Um, this one was one of my groups. This, this <laughs> the name Cloud Shelf was after a particularly long and particularly brutal um, group discussion on what the name of the site should be and no one was happy with Cloud Shelf. Um, but it's actually a site for people who are a big fan of a particular uh, fictional world like Lord of the Rings, um, where they could get together and share things and that would have sort of the Lord of the Rings world encompasses these books and these movies. 
Um, so it was a social networking site around that. I wanted to come back to this. We think that this kind of project gives a pretty good understanding of how a website works with the database, with HTML, with bringing the, all of these things together to have an interactive experience on the web. After doing this project, students understand much better how is it that Facebook works? How is it that these things that I use every day actually work? In the same way, they just built a website that works. They have a cool thing. Um, at the end of the camp, every group we put all of their we put their sites up online so that they can share a link, they can show their friends They're like, hey, we built this cool thing. Um, problem solving is a little bit hard to describe, but pretty much every single thing that you go through when you're building a site like this is problem solving. So that keeps those kids happy. Um, before I finish, um, I yes, some of you are teachers, we do know that. Um, we do bring teachers to NCSS as well. This is a, as a professional development program. There is no kind of special teacher curriculum for this. We, as teachers, you would just be part of one of the groups also working on the site with the students and learning Python alongside the students. Um, as you can see, our happy looking teachers here love it. We've had um, an amazing amount of great feedback from the teachers that it's fun to be one of the students. Um, and it's fun to see kind of how the group of students put in this sort of reasonably high pressure environment uh, come together and build a cool thing. Um, and you get to be one of the students participating, building the site, um, participating in the, the scavenger hunt and the, all of the random group activities. If you want to, you don't have to. Um, also, um, if you want free access to all of Grok Learning's online courses, we tend to do that for teachers if you ask us nicely. Um, so ask me about that. Um, and this is the end of my talk. <coughs> Just want to plug the NCSS challenge starting on Monday. The first week isn't worth any points, so if you start in the second week, so Monday week, then that also works. But highly recommend. <laughs>